welcome to another episode of the Inspiring Leadership Podcast, brought to you by Pursue, a bespoke leadership coaching and development company with a mission to create, nurture and develop inspiring leadership across the global education sector and beyond. My name is Nicholas Mackay, Associate Professor, Certified Professional Coach and Director of Pursue, and I'll be your host as we bring you cutting edge stories from across the world of leadership delving into the minds of recognised education and industry experts to find out about the challenges and main issues they are facing and to gain insights into inspiring leadership. In this series, we are proud to be in partnership with Independent School Management Plus and International School Magazine, the leading authority and voice for professionals in independent and international education worldwide. If you'd like to watch the video of today's podcast, please head over to schoolmanagementplus.com. We're also supported by Fabicia, the Federation of British International Schools in Asia, a diverse and inclusive community of 78 leading British international schools spanning 18 countries across the Asia region. Many thanks for your continued engagement and feedback across the podcast platforms. And if you'd like to join the Pursue conversation, you can always visit us on our website, pursue.com, LinkedIn and Twitter at Nicholas Mackay and Pursue. OK, so let's get on with today's episode in which we turn our sights to the UK and China. And I'm delighted to welcome Mike Seaton. Mike is an award-winning British educator who has led schools to consistency outstanding performance in Europe, the Middle East and Southeast Asia. In England, Mike was head at one of the leading independent schools in Yorkshire, Huddersfield Grammar School, achieving its first Sunday Times rankings for excellence, national media attention for curricular innovation and a best school award for successful change management. Mike's success at this school has resulted in his appointment to the European executive team of the Global Education Group Cognita, where he oversaw the development of 12 independent schools as Director of Education UK. Mike has been Vice Principal in Brighton College al Ain and also leadership posts in schools in Indonesia and the Middle East. Mike, thank you so much for joining me today. It's a pleasure to be here, Nick. Looking forward to it. Fantastic. So the Inspiring Leadership podcast, the first question is around inspiring leadership. So what does inspiring leadership look like to you, Mike? Well, first, I think any type of good leadership is, is about galvanising others to deliberately create a positive outcome that would not have otherwise happened. So any leader should start from a collegiate mindset, should review all of the evidence that they have in front of them before acting. I think but an inspiring leader um, will then have the steel to make strong decisions and the persuasive qualities to take members of the team with them. And I think those persuasive qualities are key to inspiration. You know, you've got to be able to at times water the stone to you know, convince somebody who might be dead against something that you firmly believe in to support it. And, and when it comes to persuasive qualities, I, I make a couple of observations about what I think it takes to galvanize others into action. The first thing you need to do is you need to have a really keen awareness of the strengths and the less effective areas of practice in a school in order to be able to make any sort of credible case for change. Without pretty intensive self-evaluation mechanisms in place, you're going to get lost quite quickly. But then you need to have a strong vision of excellence. And um, I, I guess throughout my career, when I focused on vision, um, th th I focused on something that really, really strikes a chord, not just with our pupils and parents, but also with teachers. And it's often one for me that's driven by a sense of social mission, uh, one that can excite the teachers and stir them into, you know, affirmative action. I think as leaders, we need to remember that the significant majority of teachers go into education one way or another to make the world a better place. And so as leaders, we need to uh, appeal to and embrace that mindset, package it into something really tangible, that sense of, of why we do it. So I think in my career, the, the notion of social mission has been quite important when it comes to that strong vision of excellence to take staff with me. And in terms of a vision, Mike, it's, you know, it's, it's always that, that balance, isn't it, between your own personal vision and maybe that yeah. of, of the leadership team and that of the, maybe the collective. So how do you go about balancing that, that collaborative decision and, um, and vision? Yeah, well, I, the, the first thing is the vision must always be tailored to the context. And right. there is an awful lot of work that goes into um, unpicking what that vision should be. Uh, and I think at Huddersfield Grammar School, I probably spent over 100 hours um, talking individually to both prospective parents 
and current parents and all of the staff at length before we came close to generating <laughs> a, you know, a way forward. So the thing that's quite different about my current context at King's College School Chengdu, of course, is we are a startup. Um, so we, we arrive with a clear sense of purpose and a clear sense of mission. Uh, but in our case, of course, we can lean on King's College School Wimbledon, um, you know, with all of its success and also our partners, Deep on Education. So two very different contexts. In the case of Huddersfield, I was coming into post uh, you know, I wasn't founding a school. And so it took, you know, six to nine months to really understand what made the school tick, what was lacking, but also what the wants and needs of parents were more widely. And within our context at Huddersfield, it was fascinating to speak to all of these parents individually, because there are a few things that concerned them about education in their locale. The first of one, uh, the first of which was this notion of what is actually happening to childhood. Okay. You know, with, with mobile phone addiction. Cyber addiction, yeah. cyber bullying, yeah, social uh, media, etc. Social less time outdoors. Mm. What's happening to childhood? And so, actually, when we came to arriving at a vision for, for Huddersfield collectively, it was about almost about reclaiming childhood. It was about giving the children in school not just the best experience of going to school, but the best experience in school of being a child. Uh, and that that came about as a result of you know concerns that parents were expressing, and that's what I refer to as a social mission because that galvanizes your staff as well. You know, you 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 identify a societal issue, and you try to solve it for for the children in your care. I suppose it's really interesting with the different contexts you've worked in, Mike. I mean, obviously yeah. at the moment you're your founding head of King's College Chen Chengdu which is, it looks it's going to be a fantastic project. It's just over 2,000 students projected at capacity, isn't it? Yeah, Tell us a little right. bit about that project and how you're involved in it. It's an absolutely fascinating prospect. and It would have taken a lot for me to, you know, probably to go into a project like this. The thing that's fascinating about it is we, you know, those of us who've worked overseas know all about uh, the British school that exports, uh, you know, its, its way of doing things overseas. And we've seen many examples of that. And it can work to varying degrees of success, can't it? You know, uh, mm. schools that believe that they're going to be able to entirely replicate themselves from start to finish uh, often get a wake up call quite early in a different context. Um, this is a very deliberate partnership. Partnership is the key word. Uh, you know, Andrew Halls, the, the headmaster of King's Wimbledon, uh, you know, decided the school would go into partnership with Deepon Education, yeah. um, not to replicate the King's experience abroad, but to try to forge a new educational model that combine the best of Eastern and Western education. And, uh, and equally, DEPOM, you know, have been doing bilingual education for three decades. So know a thing or two about what it takes. In fact, DEPOM were absolute pioneers. They were the, the first educational group to welcome Cambridge international examinations into the country. Well, okay. um, and, you know, way back in the 90s, they saw um, that the way things were going to move in terms of parents' desire to, to, to give their children an opportunity to have an experience of, you know, of accessing kind of world leading universities overseas. So that this notion of partnership was very important to me and it kind of appealed to my intellectual curiosity. Um, the other thing that is really striking um, about working with Kings Wimbledon is their incredible sense of support. Uh, and, there, you know, you, you'll see lots of British schools operating overseas. And if I can be honest, some operate at arm's length. You know, others want to get more involved. Others do so through a th third party. Yeah. With Kings, the, the suite of professional development courses they're going to be offering our staff internationally, even from Wimbledon, is considerable. I think that's really exciting and it makes it really tangible for our staff. So a few, a few kind of key areas there, but this notion of partnership and of forging something new, I think, is at the heart of it. And in terms of partnership then, Mike, is this around the approach of the school? So... And again, I've been looking at your website. You've got that. Yes. Is it A levels and GCSEs on the, yeah. on the international so, strand? Yeah. So we'll be delivering um, basically, uh, you know, a bilingual school. Uh, now the, it's largely for Chinese children. So the Chinese yeah. national curriculum, quite rightly, in that context, is mandatory. Um, there's not that much to, to differentiate the two, actually. You know, when you look, for example, at the uh, the early years on paper, the ways of doing things are very similar. But yeah. we are committed to delivering that, and we we, re we refer a lot to Chinese roots and global futures you know the children get that mandatory Chinese national curriculum but it's delivered uh, in a way that will make the most of international pedagogy and that is the challenge you know that's the key mm. differentiator uh, opening up those critical thinking skills and it's not easy 
um, but it's something that we're committed to working towards. When they get into the senior school, uh, it's then the IGCCs and A-levels. So they need to arrive into the senior school at that level of English language fluency uh, to really you know, you know, have a good shot at, uh, uh, at achieving well in those. So it combines a few different factors, but within the way that we actually construct the school, we'll have teams of Chinese and largely British teachers actually working together to develop the curriculum. And there's a very clear understanding from every member of staff who's joining this project that the partnership is the key. You know, this isn't a sense of imposing one model upon the other. Uh, it's about forging something new. In terms of, um, say, the Chinese teachers teaching in a maybe more global outlook and a global way, how are you going to go yeah. about facilitating that, then, Mike? Well, for, firstly, um, we've been very, very successful in appointments. So uh, I can tell you that a very large number of the Chinese teachers, for example, that we are, uh, that we have recruited, um, have international backgrounds. You know, they, they, they've come, you know, yeah. study the, the likes of Columbia and New York and, you know, top leading international universities. Often they've studied in the UK. My deputy head middle school, um, uh, you know, is from Chengdu, um, went over to do natural sciences at Cambridge, went to sixth form college in Rochdale of all places before she Rochdale. Down. That's not far from yeah. Huddersfield then, mate. <laughs> not far, no. <laughs> and, um, and so she's, you know, she she is an example of teachers who've had a taste both in terms of their own education and then later in terms of delivering it yeah. within an internationalized context. So the appointments have been have been really key. But one thing that's also fundamentally important to our school is professional development. And uh, you know, we will have um, an, a mandatory hour a week and all sorts of other opportunities through breakfast forums and uh, teach meets uh, with the other King's schools and with the Wimbledon counterpart for teachers to develop their practice. And that will be very much differentiated and tailored to individual needs. So for our Chinese staff, yes, there'll be lots of work on kind of international you know, pedagogy and the sorts of methods that we're more used to in the UK. But equally for our Western staff, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll need to adapt and understand and come to know all of the strengths of Chinese education, which, you know, let's not, you know, let's be honest, Chinese education is extremely successful. China has, by quite some margin, the best test takers anywhere in the world, yeah. where we can, you know, offer um, and really add value will be through the development of a, a thriving co-curricular activities program and through a really tailored approach to pastoral care. You know, we, we actually have presented to parents in China about three pillars, the academics, the co-curricular, the pastoral. None of those will be of any surprise whatsoever to any HMC head or yeah. anyone who works in a British independent school. But within the China context, parents sit up. This is something slightly different. You know, this notion of, yes, you can have the academics and the co-curricular and the tailored pastoral care and still get, you know, the end product and the, the destination university for your child. It's really interesting, isn't it? Um, yeah. I know they're quite education and yeah. fan fantastic education group. And it, it, there's a massive boom, as you know, Mike, about, you know, bilingual education in China. So having that, that, that mix of the, the Chinese curriculum and also that Western outlook, as you mentioned. So in terms of recruitment from, say, the uh, expat teachers, what are you looking for when, you know, you're building a school from, from the off? Well, I mean, yeah, there, there are examples of, of, of teachers we've hired who've already got that bilingual experience. We've, yeah. we've hired a number of teachers uh, who don't just have excellent kind of academic backgrounds, but also have been working in China for a number of years. So that's, yeah. you know, that's one obvious help for us. Um, but I think when you're recruiting to start up, OK, what you're looking for is quite specific. Uh, you're looking for people who are quite malleable. You're looking for people yeah. who are highly resilient, yeah. people who are adventure seeking, not in terms of wanting to travel, to travel the globe, you know, uh, although that's an added bonus, uh, but really want to, you know, get their hands dirty and create a legacy. And so within our common room, there's four or five people we've recruited who want to be heads, right. you know, who, who are, uh, you know, quite young and, and, and dynamic and want to, want to make impacts. So you've got to also, and I mentioned it, already you've got to be intellectually curious you've got to be willing to step outside of your comfort zone and undertake a, a kind of new phase of your own learning and professional de development so it's a combination of of those factors but certainly you know the died in the wall um kind of long-standing kind of hmc teacher in some instances might not be appropriate for us you know it's looking for that right that right fit in, in terms of, you said four people there looking to be heads and go to headship, how did yeah. that come out then in the interview process? Were they quite open about that? Yeah, I mean, firstly, you know, we're very fortunate, um, you know, as, as a King's School um, to be able to uh, attract really kind of high calibre 
teachers, yeah. prospective senior leaders. So we are very fortunate. It's a luxury for us to be able to um, to do that. I think the way that it comes out in the interview process is is when you start to talk about their professional journey so far. Um, it's a classic and cheesy question, but where do you see yourself in, in three years, in five years? It, it became apparent that, that there are a number of teachers joining us who saw this as a real opportunity to do, you know, to be part of something world class uh, over time that would set them up, you know, eventually to, you know, towards senior leadership and headship opportunities. What, one thing we've also made clear to our staff, and this is absolutely the case, um, there is never a better option for a teacher. Uh, you know who's ambitious and uh, uh, to, than to join a startup school um, like a King's, because the as the school grows, new posts come online, uh, opportunities mm. open up that weren't there. There's no such thing as you know as dead man's shoes uh, in a dynamic. <laughs> so I think you do you know you do a, you do a track. <laughs> That's nicely put, like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm curious. Before we came on, you said that you're a bit of a startup junkie. In terms yeah, of skills. So yeah, tell us yeah. a bit about that. And what, what appeals yeah, to... I, I hope that's taken by your audience in the right way. But, <laughs> yeah. uh, no, I mean, I think startup offers just an, an absolutely extraordinary opportunity for yeah. um, a founding head um, because you, you, you have an opportunity basically to build the school, both in terms of bricks and mortar mm. uh, and in terms of the development of a senior leadership team that's really exciting, uh, in terms of recruitment, policy making. You know, your procedural expectations. Uh, it just gives you that kind of bird's eye view of, of all of the components that make schools tick. And then you get to see it fall into place. And that is an absolute joy, you know, to, to see things come into fruition and to see the ideas jump out of the page and into people's lives, um, you know, in a new territory, really, Chengdu, um, in a, a relatively unexplored territory for, uh, for schools like us. It, it's just really exciting. And, you know, you have to have a sense of humour. You know, there will be the occasionally comedic moments when things don't <laughs> quite go as you'd intended. But yeah, but yeah for, for somebody who um, who wants to leave legacy, it's just a fantastic thing. And I went through it, of course, before in the UAE. And one thing that's really interesting, I think, about startup is, you know, I, I, there are many examples of them sprouting all over the place, particularly in China. And believe it or not, there are some of those schools that will, 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 will start life. Got the dog barking in the background there, Nick. Sorry. Uh, that's fine, Mike. No problem at all. What well, dog have you got, Mike? I've got two UAE oh. rescue dogs, actually. So uh, oh, are they? from my time with Brighton, yeah. So uh Tilly and Peaches, and Peaches is the most badly named dog of all time. Um Pe Peachy. Pe Peaches, yeah. Peaches. So, but when you actually when you actually encounter her, she's anything but a peaches. So, <laughs> so there we go. But uh, but no, um I think the um where was I, Nick? I think we're talking about um the notion of um uh, of other startups and, yes. and very often more often than you'd think those schools start without a really clear procedural framework without really clear policy yeah. making place without really clear expectations and there's there's this notion sometimes that it will also somehow organically fall into place and it, it doesn't so in your policy making in startup you've got to be really precise you've got to be quite directive as a leader yeah. Um, to ensure that that culture is cemented early. So it's, you know, that, that's part of the attraction for me. It's interesting, isn't it, about directive? Because as you know, you know, in the coaching well that I do, there's always this conversation about, are you being directive? Are you being non-directive? And people get really yeah. hung up on this. And I think, and I'm going back to say 1960s and 70s now, this idea of contingency leadership, I think it's maybe more applicable now than ever with things going on and then flux. And I can probably see that, especially in a startup as well. I think so. I think, uh, you know, I've, I've had this discussion with staff and I've said, you, know, you won't necessarily read this in the leadership manuals, but we will be quite directive to start off with. And, and it's yeah. basically great schools are born from a culture and, you know, the, the culture um, has to be, um, you know, delivered and, and developed out of thin air. You know, yes, you've got yeah. fantastic support from Kings, um, you know, practically they're sharing all their resources with us giving us wonderful guidance mm -hmm. and from Deepon but there is that element of a bit of a blank sheet of paper so building that that, that culture you have to be directive um, uh, because there's a certain expectation of what a King's College school of course should, should look and feel like but then you release the valve I always say the valve released and the creativity sprouts outwards from from the start once you've got that that clarity of purpose of vision and you know the people are communicating in the right way you know people are um 
uh, you know, developing their, their their planning in a way that we, we feel is appropriate. Once you've got all of that in place, then you release the valve and then the magic kind of happens. But you have to begin by being relatively directive, I think. What I'm curious about, you mentioned communication there, Mike. So yeah. in terms of what you're looking for in communication, just take yeah. us through that a little bit. Well, I mean, well, firstly, we're operating within a, a, a slightly different context. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, it, it, we want to ensure, for example, in a, in a prestigious school, um you would well in any school but but there's perhaps an added expectation from parents within a, a school that seeks to be a premium school um that their their correspondence will be returned within a certain time frame and that everybody does that you know and and teachers are great at doing that but it's about being very clear in that expectation of how long they should have to wait um you know within a, within our context it's quite interesting because you know uh, many of our parents won't speak english yeah. And so there's an added dynamic there. So we, we, we're already looking at ways in which to ensure that we, um, for example, when we're working pastorally, uh, that we will have translation on hand. And we, we've appointed actually a very talented um, uh, Chinese educator as our assistant uh, director of pastoral and boarding. He will be a really great conduit for us in imparting some of those yeah. messages to parents that aren't easily understood. But yeah, communication as well. It's also the way that you look. You know, it sounds very... Uh, perhaps trivial, but for any, you know, would be kind of leaders out there, I think it's important to know, you know, when you're managing a school like a, a King's, there is a style guide, there mm -hmm. are, uh, there are expectations of how you express yourself. And, and when that's done consistently, um, you know, across the common room, people start to feel like they're part of, of something, they're part of something, you know, tangible rather than, I, I always speak to staff about, you know, there are certain schools that can end up as a collection of the self-employed sharing office space. You know, uh, and where there's not that clear sense of purpose, of vision, of culture, of expectation, that can very quickly happen with people working in silos. And it's about ensuring when you when you when you you know establish a startup school like a King's, that everything, even the minutiae, is carefully thought through in terms of the way that we communicate, so that you have that consistency. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that, um, Mike. I mean, in terms of like the group and the team, you, know, you can have a group of people who are getting very well socially. There's yeah. no collective purpose. There's no there's no uh, integration, and you know things then don't fly. It's about you also, how you go about you know building those structures to allow people to work together. You also made an interesting point about international education. There's a transience there. There's a yeah. transience of staff there. So it's all the more important. Yeah. In a start, you know, in a, in a, in an international environment, to be quite robust in your procedures and your policies and your ways of doing things, because people will come and go and. Uh, I had an interesting conversation, I think, with uh, our mutual friend, Dr. Whitehead, about this years ago. Oh, yeah. uh, um, what did he say? No, I, 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 would, I, would, I would never quote him. I'm sure he will speak for himself. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, he, I think he made the point that you can't control culture because it's organic. It depends yeah, on who's yeah. coming in and out. Well, that's true to a certain extent, I think, but there are certain um, key kind of areas of focus that you can establish and and pillars that, that, that people can kind of gather around and work around in what you do so you're currently in the uk mike and you're going to china yeah. soon so from where yeah. you're currently sit, sitting in the uk yeah. what do you envisage as the main challenges as you get this project going so firstly i'm, I'm yeah I'm, I'm flying out very soon which is great news uh, i have been uh, in china time uh for the last few months i've been getting up at uh extremely early in the morning and going to bed <laughs> extremely early at night so actually it's amazing isn't it with zoom and and and, and teams how, how much we've been able to get done it's been really successful so far um getting out there of course you know i think as a the, the key challenge is as an executive principal like myself when when your staff come you want to speak with authority about the location uh, about the um you know the 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 environment in which they'll be working so it's important i get out there and have that period of time myself to do my own learning yeah. um you know about the area before before we welcome them on board but with any with any um startup operation it's it's, it's the, the the dry but very important factors you know the building works and where we are with those we're looking there's excellent progress so we're likely to finish those it's likely to hand over the campus by the end of may which is great um, and then it's the nitty gritty is getting inside the buildings and um, ensuring that, uh, that that our ideas in terms of rooming and where different departments are going to be located in practice will still work. And so there's all that kind of detail to sort out before we welcome staff. But we've we're quite proud because we, we, we we've actually got pre induction underway. We call it pre induction. And so actually, rather like this conversation, we're running a fortnightly webinar 
Okay. Goes out to the entire common room. Um, and there'll be about 12 episodes of those before they even land. Now, we're very clear that those webinars are not part of the induction process. It's, it's, it's a way of quite informally getting to know one another and share ideas. So uh, I spoke on the school uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we've got uh, two um, individuals from, from King's Wimbledon joining us for the next webinar to talk about King's. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I mentioned my deputy head middle school uh, earlier who went to Cambridge. We've got a from Chengdu to Cambridge uh, discussion with her about her experience as a student, uh, you know, encountering internationalized education for the first time, having been educated at first in Chinese public schools. So lots of scene setting happening um, for our staff. But for me, it's it, really it's about um, getting on site and getting into the campus and ensuring that when the staff arrive there's that really clear sense of order all the boring stuff as well nick you know like you know resource lists and yeah, yeah. times and all the all, you know all those sorts of areas but but i'm very fortunate because Depont um is a, a great education company uh yeah. with a brilliant infrastructure and so their procurement is fantastic it's spot on and uh, some of the issues i've encountered in the past you know aren't, aren't present we know that stuff is arriving on time and uh, you know, and we'll have a very, very exciting school, hopefully, when we open in August. So, how many times have you been to Chengdu, Mike? So, I've been on one occasion, okay. um, and um, I'm looking forward to getting out there, you know, again and and spending uh, more time there. It's a fascinating place. Mm. Um, you know, most of us would have heard of the Go West initiative in China. Mm. Uh, you know, moving away from those. Uh, or not moving away, but, but taking some of the magic of, of, of Shanghai and Beijing and you know, the coastal cities on the east yeah. uh, and going west. And Chengdu is, is a, a city you know, of 20 million people that already has one of the best performing economies in the world, but is actually known within China as being a more laid back place. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and what, what is happening in Chengdu at the moment is, is, is so interesting because you've got a combination of old China you know, some beautiful kind of natural scenery and, and architecture and, you know, the, the, the gentlemen frequenting the tea houses and all of that charm. Um, but then they're following the Shanghai economic model. Nice. So, you know, what's happening to Chengdu is it's a very exciting you know place to be. And it, I think to spend a few years in Chengdu is to understand what's happening in China more widely at the moment. So is it called the green city? I know there's lots of green spaces. in China. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, the, the Garden City. The Garden thing. City, that's it, yeah. You've got these extraordinary, uh, th th there's lots of um, uh, legislation that's been passed to ensure that that's protected. So some of the planning is phenomenal. Uh, if you think about Dubai and the way that they built mm. up the Dubai landscape, um, in, in Chengdu, they're, they're very committed to protecting green space and actually enhancing it. And you, you, you'll you even see uh, rather quaintly the occasional skyscraper covered in foliage, which is always a sight to behold. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. <laughs> I'm really curious, actually, Mike, because again, going back to what we spoke about at the beginning about your yeah. experience. So what are you going to draw upon? Because you've got Director of Education UK for Cognito, you've, you know, Huddersfield Grammar. You've also worked in, yeah. in the Mid Middle East and Indonesia. What are you going to draw upon and going to utilise and leverage in your most junior role? And all of the above, really. I mean, I think any any anybody who arrives at, at a job without having, you know, been sponge like in in, you know, developing and improving their understanding of education. I think I'm lucky because, because I mean, one piece of advice I would give to somebody early in their career would be to have ex get experience of different school contexts and working within different school contexts. Yeah. So I've worked in the state sector, I've worked in a brand new academy, I've worked in an HMC school in Indonesia, yeah. I've done a startup for a British school. You know, there's been a whole, whole range of, uh, of different things that I've, I've taken on board. Probably the Brighton experience um, for this particular project is particularly useful because it was a it was a startup and it was a very very successful startup uh you know i've got the likes of alan yoroth to thank for that um he did a great job when he came in as as as, as the overall headmaster but it, i learned a lot from that experience but also a lot about what goes wrong you know yeah. and uh, and how you respond when things don't go as planned i think within the um you know, the, the, the experience, for example, with Cognita and at Huddersfield Grammar School, uh, we were very fortunate. We won a national award um, for successful change management. And, uh, you know, I think, um, you know, change management is very uh, is a very useful skill set to have, I think, coming into something like this, because we are actually trying to change the educational landscape where international education uh, exists in Chengdu. Um, 
it's fair to say that the uh, the population of Chengdu have not been fully seduced by it yet. And of course, nor should they, um, yeah. because there are some fantastic Chinese public schools. Um, but we want to, you know, be a real game changer in the city. Um, and so having that experience of delivering sort of successful change management has been has been helpful as well. You mentioned legacy a couple of times, Mike. Yeah. So what legacy would you like to leave here? Well, I think, you know, there's, a, there's an old saying, isn't there, uh, in the leadership manuals that, you know, great leadership leaves its footprints. Uh, and that's really what I always think about uh, when it comes to uh, operating any school. And uh, if you can, as I've said, you know, earlier, be very directive at first, but then eventually you can step away and even occasionally go missing in action, or they're not literally, and things work like clockwork. Um, and the school culture is set. Um, there's consistency and it's it's a word that's perhaps overused but uh, great schools are always consistent in what they do i think you know that's that's a really important uh factor so i think legacy is about um developing people um you know and we've spoken a lot about the establishment of a school uh, a school will never thrive unless leadership is distributed and future leaders are, are, are given platforms to you know to share their ideas and, and push things forward and i think to develop teaching staff uh is one aspect um of le leaving your footprints that, that's so vital to ensure that people feel that they've got the autonomy to try things out to maybe make mistakes and get things wrong is something that emerges over time but first and foremost the focus is is, is on the pupils and leaving legacy is is, is building a school that that actually meets those aspirations, the aspirations that we have, which is to ensure access for these children where possible to world-class international universities. You know, and we'll be doing our job if we begin to do that whilst you know, broadening their skill sets and giving them those co-curricular opportunities as well to become not just interested people, but interesting people. And again, Mike, if I can just push you a little bit further, wider, yeah. broader here, in terms of the legacy of your career, yeah. What footprint would you have liked to have left? So not just this project, but kind of wider. Well, that's a that's a big question. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, perhaps I should spend a bit more time. <laughs> um, I, I think uh, you know, I I came into education to in some way make a difference, uh, a positive difference, and um, I came into education. It wasn't my first career. And um, I want to be able to, I suppose, look back on my career and feel that I, I, I did everything I possibly could, um, you know, in my career to achieve the objectives of the school for the students uh, and, and to give them opportunities that they may not otherwise have, have necessarily had. You know, there's a joke, my, my father won't forgive me for saying this, but my, my probably my, my father is a big inspiration for me. My dad was a consultant physician. Okay. Um, for many years and uh he 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 i my, my sense of work ethic i got from him and he was somebody who um uh when i was walking to the football with him one day after he retired i was joking with him and i said do you ever wish you'd spend a bit more time with us you know and uh you know kind of because you work so hard and he paused and he went no regrets and i said why not and he said because i couldn't possibly have worked any harder than i did <laughs> so he completely he completely misunderstood the question um <laughs> But yeah, but but this this idea of 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 really just just working really hard for the school and and uh, that you're in and and leaving a legacy perhaps where um uh you've made life a bit a little bit better and you've opened doors for for young people that they might not otherwise have have seen or, or been able to open. Great. Um, just a couple of questions to, to, to finish as you bring this uh, um, kind of yeah. chat to a close, mind. So in, in terms of you've talked about advice maybe going forward, but in terms of you, your own. Um, career what advice would you have given yourself at the start of your career to yourself yeah that's a that's a that's a good question i think um there's a few things i'd say first firstly i don't i don't have that many regrets because i think i've learned from everything that's gone well and gone horribly wrong at certain points um so one one thing i would tell myself is is when things go wrong and when things don't work out to ensure that you've got the resilience to you know to bounce back and to learn from a mistake and to reflect on it and i think i've done that pretty well there's one thing i might i'm going to say that might be slightly unfashionable um but i became consumed quite early in my career with educational jargon 
<laughs> there's a lot of educational jargon about and I still receive uh, applications from teachers uh, and I've read a page and a half and um, it's full of jargon I've learned nothing about the individual and I think um, at yeah, Brighton they always used to say uh, you know no educational jargon just say what you actually mean and I think uh, you know I've learned to do that over my career and, and moved away from being slightly jargon centric uh, when I was first first starting out and I think there's you know that as if anything broadened over the over recent years you only have to go on the twitter sphere um to see the kind of uh the war between the progs and the trads playing out before your <laughs> before your eyes and i was actually asked in an interview uh, you know how would you describe yourself and i said well i'm not a trog and a, i'm not a prog i'm i'm a i'm a trog <laughs> It was only later that I realised that means contemptible person. So uh, <laughs> I, stopped, I stopped calling myself that quite quickly. <laughs> oh, I like that, yeah. Um, in, in, in terms of the, the jargon, just, just quickly a question on that. You know, what's some, some jargon that, that you look at and you think, oh, no, that's just, you know, well, I mean, that's I, too I, much? It's a bit of a bad example, really, but if you the notion of PSHE, for example, you know, I, I that, that has had about fifteen different incarnations. Each time, another letter is added. Um, but it, <laughs> you know, th th things like that. And actually, I was I, I remember it earlier in my career, I introduced uh, kind of a well-being uh, with colleagues, a kind of well-being platform, and we just referred to it as well-being. We actually put a slide up with all the different incarnations and acronyms that it had been called over the years. And I, you know, I think, but I think the most culpable countries for jargon are the British and the Americans, mm. um, I must say. And I think there's something quite refreshing, um, actually, in working with the Chinese, uh, who are a lot better at saying what they mean, perhaps, than we sometimes are. That's great, Mike. And just the, the last question, linking again to this inspiring leadership. So who's most inspired you in your career journey? So I mean, I've already spoken about my 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 dad, which yeah. you know, uh, you know, uh, he was a big inspiration to me uh, in terms of we knew, we we knew he was working hard, but we knew that he was he was saving lives and he was helping people. Mm. So it was we 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 understood what he was doing. He's a massive inspiration to me. Um, there was a teacher I had um, head teacher first head teacher said to me, um, get experience uh, of uh, as many different school contexts as you as you can if you want to be ahead. And um, and I've done that. And I think for anybody who wants to be ahead, don't be afraid to have a few different school experiences because you learn so much more, I think, um, than um, th than perhaps just staying in the single school for a very long period. Uh, so that would be uh, that would be one thing I think um, perhaps that, um, that that was said to me by this this first head teacher uh, that stuck with me, and I've I you know. I've learned from and, and you know, on, on a couple of occasions, um, it's going back to the advice I give myself, you know, on a couple of, there's one occasion when I went for the right job, but the context was really wrong. And uh, I ignored his advice because he'd said, make sure the context is right. <laughs> okay, right. And it's important to really consider the context into which you're, 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 you're moving in a school, I think, um, you know, really early. So yeah, he, those words stuck with me. Yeah. That's great. Mike, thanks so much for your time today. It's been really insightful. Um, really enjoyed speaking to you again. Um, and I know that you're very busy, so I wish you the very best of luck with your new project. Thank uh, you very much. And let's 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 keep in touch as well. It'll be really fascinating to know how, how things go. I'll definitely be following uh, King's College Chengdu. Yeah, looking forward to, uh, to, to, to to catching up with you. Perhaps a year down the line when I've got a few more grey hairs, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> it's happened to all of us. Right. I was looking in the mirror the other day and I'm thinking, I've really aged this. this, this you don't look as over 25, don't worry. <laughs> it's armor. <laughs> That's very much Mike. All right. If you're interested in elevating your leadership practice in partnership with Pursue through our coaching and leadership development packages, or would like to connect to discuss any of the topics of the show, please send me an email at hello at pursue.com or visit our website to pursue.com. You can also follow me on LinkedIn and Twitter at Nicholas Mackay or Pursue. And if you enjoyed the show, please leave a rating and spread the word. We are proud to be developing a truly global audience. Take care and look forward to speaking to you again soon.